Um, next, we're going to be having a uh, remote and in-person talk um, between uh, Sam and Peter. Um, so I don't know which one of you is going to going to start. Sam's going to start. I'm going to start. Great. Sounds good. All right. Hey, my name is uh, Sam Wellborn, and I'm a postdoc in the Data Science Engagement Group here at NERSC. Um, and yeah, like Nick was saying, this is kind of going to be a joint presentation between Peter Urshis, who is sitting in the room, uh, and me. And so I'll kind of introduce the concept that we'll be talking about and build up um, you know, how we implemented this streaming service from NSEM, which is a part of the Molecular Foundry, and NERSC. So what we're doing is taking data uh, from a microscope and streaming it directly into compute nodes for on-the-fly uh, processing. So um, why would we want to do something like this? So we're really facing this major problem um, at, at and uh, with, with data generation rates. And this is because detector technology has kind of exp uh, exploded these rates. So you can see in 1930, uh, when we were still putting in film into our instruments, we would put a piece of film into a microscope, we would shine some electrons on it, and then we would remove that and manually measure stuff. But that's just not uh, what we do today. And uh, the, the data generation rate has gone up by about five uh, orders of magnitude here. And so this is not just a problem at microscopy facilities, it's also a problem at light sources where these detectors are uh, being installed, you know, at ALS, NSLS2, and APS. Um, and these facilities will, it's been projected that they'll cumulatively generate an exabyte of data per year by 2028. Um, so this is not only going to require some kind of special way of managing this data, but also uh, really, uh, you know, centralized compute and on-demand compute for for that data to be, to be processed and kind of return back to the user in a timely manner. Um, and so that kind of brings us to this pathfinding project that we've been working on with the Molecular Foundry. The Molecular Foundry sits here in Berkeley Lab and NERSC is over here. And they're connected by a 100 gigabit ethernet uh, link. So we're able to pump data from the Molecular Foundry over to NERSC pretty quickly, um, but we're, we're working towards a way to do this in a, lot, in a lot faster way by removing file IO, and I'll get into that uh, here in a few slides. So who is the Molecular Foundry? And Peter can do a better job of introducing this, but um, the national, the Molecular Foundry is a, a large user facility, and the National Center for Electron Microscopy is one of seven facilities there. So, NSEM has a, a, an amazing amount of instruments that these users can come to, you know, look at their cool materials with. So the user has great idea they can come and build their material at the molecular foundry and then look at it with these state-of-the-art instruments but they also have uh, access to experts like peter who are leaders in uh, you know state-of-the-art methods so the one um, method that i'll be talking about today is this technique called four-dimensional scanning transmission electron microscopy and before you understand uh, 4D STEM, you have to know what STEM is. So STEM, which is scanning transmission electron microscopy, is a technique where you put your sample into a vacuum chamber and then you you focus an electron probe over the onto the surface of that material, and then you raster that electron probe across the sample, and you put detectors at various locations below or around that sample. And so in kind of the uh, conventional detector technology, one of the one of these detectors that you can put in is called an annular dark field detector. And what that does is at every point along the surface of the sample, 
uh, you're collecting the scattered electrons that are coming off of the sample around a ring at relatively high angles of scattering. And when you hit one particular probe position, um, you collect all of them and you get one piece of information. That's how many electrons hit that detector at that probe position. But what you're throwing out is a lot of information in diffraction space, which you can see at the bottom here. So what you can do is you can put another pixelated detector down below this, this dark field detector. And what you end up with is another image for each probe position on your sample. And so this results in a four-dimensional data set, two dimensions for your sample in, in real space. And then for each uh, one of those pixels in real space, you get a full 2D image in diffraction space. Um, and so this really ends up being uh, make, making really large data sets. And so this, this uh, camera, this, this 4D camera that I was mentioning earlier, is installed on this microscope called the Team 0.5 at NSEM. And it generates data at 480 gigabits per second. And so that you know, roughly corresponds to is a 700 gigabyte data set can be collected in about 15 seconds. And this is huge. So like the, the question is, how do we manage this data? Well, if you if you look here, this is what this data actually looks like. And because the camera is so fast and it captures data so quickly, we can actually pick up individual electron events hit on this detector. And it it, it looks just like a, a kind of speckle pattern that is very sparse and so we can remove we can remove a lot of this uh data that aren't those electron hits so we can take this 700 gigabyte data set and reduce it down to to 10 to 20 gigabytes per data set so uh how do we do that well it's um the original workflow that was set up um used and peter will mention this a little bit i think in his presentation that they would do this locally on their computers at NSEM. But this process would take a really long time and you can't use that edge compute while you're also writing data to their local file system. So a file transfer workflow was set up so that the user could sit on the microscope and collect uh, data. And what they're doing when they take a scan is that that data is you know collected and it's sent by UDP to four data receiving servers. And it's sent through these FPGAs and the, 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 the frame on the 4D camera is divided into four sectors. So the data is kind of split up amongst these four servers. And um, that data is then written after the buffer inside of each of these servers is filled up. It's written to disk on this network file system. What happens then is the user looks at distiller, which is a user interface uh, to their data. They, they can see a scan pop up. So some file event tells distiller uh, that there is a new scan. And distiller is an application that was developed in collaboration with Kitware, by, uh, with Kitware and NSEM that runs on spin. And so the user just is looking at this React front end. So they can press buttons that'll call uh, some features in the back end that will eventually call the super facility API. And when they wanna move their data over to NERSC, they uh, click that transfer button and it moves, it starts up a job to move data uh, over to NERSC, write it on scratch and then process the data and you finally get out this one reduced data set in a single HDF5 file. So here's the, the, the issue with, with this workflow. File IO is generally, especially for these like really large uh, data sets, is really slow. So you have these four servers that each write to um, binary files on that network file system. And for that really large data set, it takes about two and a half minutes to do that. So the user, it clicks scan, 
and they have to wait two and a half minutes just for their data to be on the disk. Um, and so our goal with this, um, with moving to a RAM to RAM transfer is to speed this process up so they avoid that entire, um, that wait time. So here what you're seeing is instead of saving anything to a local disk, both at NSEM and uh, at NERSC, we just move the data from the RAM at NSEM to RAM in, um, in, in NERSC compute nodes. And to do this, we've set up a series of zero MQ sockets. These are these connect each of the these parts of our pipeline. So these data receivers are basically producer processes. They have sockets to push their data down to a centralized aggregator process. This aggregator process also runs at NSEM. Um, and we have to do this because these guys aren't connected to NERSC in any way. We have to find some way to get them to a central point and then fan them out to NERSC. And so what, what does this fanning out process look like? The, the data receivers, as you will remember, these receivers are each receiving a single sector of a frame. So all of these make up one image that we need to analyze. But we need to so so we need to figure out a way to get all four of those sectors to a very particular node for that data processing to happen so this uh centralized aggregator it says okay i know that this frame this sector belongs on this node and so it sends it to the correct location and then finally um you know these these consumer processes at nurse they're pulling in this data and finally writing to an HDF5 file. So yeah, and so, so the results here show that the streaming workflow has a much tighter distribution of the transfer and count times. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but the count uh, counting is what we call this reduction operation. So we call it electron counting. Um, the transfer and and count times for streaming is a much narrowed narrower distribution and it's a much um it, it's a much faster process so you can see that with file transfer since we're relying on things like the file system you can have a pretty wide distribution of times that it would take to run a, a particular size of data set over to, to nurse can do this counting process Okay, so I'm gonna show you a, a bit of a demo on how uh, this looks like for the user and compare the file transfer workflow to the this new streaming uh, workflow. So this is distiller, this front end. And what you just saw is a scan that was uh, acquired. And then the user can you know take some notes on that scan. And then once they have, um, you know, acquired this scan, they can press this count button that's going to move their data over. And they can change some parameters in here, like the threshold level. They submit that, and uh, this uses the Super Facility API again to, to uh, start up a job. And you can see that it's get, been given a Slurm ID, and, you know, they, they can kind of track the progress of this um, as it uh, as it moves forward, um, yeah. So you can see that its state is is now active and it's being processed. And instead of so instead of for each acquisition having to go and run this uh, count operation, uh, okay. And one one other thing, the the user can then click this button that says. I'm gonna go into a notebook now. This notebook is templated and I can just run through this notebook uh, with this particular data set and analyze this data. In the streaming uh, kind of workflow, we just have to start up one job. And so what you're doing here, and I'll talk about this in a minute, uh, is submitting this job and these consumer processes will show up at NERSC for all of the processes at NSEM to send their data into. And so that's the same kind of uh, dialogue box that you saw earlier, but now we're just starting a job for a whole session. And for 
So, so I guess what does this look like for the user actually taking data on the microscope? What you're seeing here on the right is the data acquisition system at NSIM. And, you know, nothing is going on right now, but we're in the middle of a script. So you can see that this was just acquired. And then there is some uh, data flowing from NSEM into NERSC. And you can see that, you know, it's been given, uh, it's at NERSC and now it's like ready to analyze. So the user doesn't have to go in and click a button to say, okay, let's count this data now. They just have to move around to the correct location in their sample and, you know, press go. Okay. So for some of you, you might be wondering like why or what's really happening when I'm starting a session. So the user, they when they click this button to start a session, they'll see this dialogue window. And you can see here that it says active. This is a uh, machine, uh, Perlmutter is active. If Perlmutter was degraded or down, they would also see this kind of status here. This is using what Bjorn just talked about in the super facility API um, to check whether Perlmutter is up or not. If it's not there, then they can't submit a job. So when they press the submit button, what's going on is it's sending a, a message to the distiller backend, which creates a job in the distiller database. And it creates uh, an event at the same time. Uh, and that event is sent uh, through our Kafka system to um, workers that are listening on the jobs topic. So the jobs worker is just waiting for new jobs to show up. And then this jobs worker, depending on the, the parameters that are given in the front end, will create this templated job script. And then it'll send a request to the super facility API to start up a job. And that job is just uh, the consumer processes that we've developed for, you know, bringing up zero MQ sockets uh, to receive data and then consume the data as it comes in. Okay, so I guess a, di a kind of different question that's not uh, exactly connected to, to what I was just talking about in distiller is now we have all of these processes that are producing and aggregating data um, and consuming data, but how do all of those know, how do all of those processes know about what's going on with the rest of the network. Um, well, so each each of the processes in our pipeline is a client in a, distri uh, a distributed key value store. And this distributed key value store is nothing fancy. It's just a, a bunch of clients sending messages to uh, the rest of the network saying what their unique ID is and what their status is, whether they're idle or streaming or um, and what their current scan number is, these kind of state things for an individual client, along with their ports and IP addresses. And so what, what happens when a client joins the network, it'll send a message to a centralized server. That centralized server <laughs> kind of tracks all of this state and receives messages, updates the global state, and then sends that state out to the rest of the clients. And so what you, you have uh, with a, what you have with, you know, these consumers now joining into this network is the ability for the producers, the things that are receiving the data from the microscope to know whether or not they should start sending data downstream to NERSC or whether they should just write to disk. So as, you, as soon as you pull up these consumer processes at NERSC, the, the, uh, producers know that they're available to send <laughs> and then can push data down downstream. Um, so, you know, moving on to like sort of the, the broader implications of this, we've, we've implemented this, this streaming protocol that gives NSEM a, you know, a faster turnaround time, but I think, I guess more broadly and more importantly, it, it removes the human in the loop from a particular step of this pipeline. And that leads to happier experimentalists um, in general. Like I, I used to be an experimentalist. I, I hated having to click an extra button that I didn't have uh, that I didn't have to while I was running this, you know, time sensitive experiment. 
and I only have a very limited time on this machine to, to you know, uh, get some cool results. And uh, as Debbie was talking about earlier, this is one kind of pathway to uh, this, this integrated research infrastructure project. Um, so I guess with that, I can move on uh, or we can move forward. I'd like to thank everyone that was you know, involved in this project. And then Peter, um, I think he's, are you, are you there, Peter? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, and and I guess while Peter is getting set up, I can take uh, any questions if that works. Hi, thanks. Great talk. Thanks for setting all that up. I don't have to do so much of the setup, <laughs> which is great. So I just want to go over why this is so important to us, where all this work, we did a whole bunch of work to try to get this thing to work. And then Sam came along and was like, oh, we can do this way better. And I was like, yes. So let's do that. And now users on the machine, the first thing they ask is, how do I talk to Sam and how do we get this to work? Because they don't want to do it the old way anymore. And it's allowing us to do a whole lot more um, um, experiments. So what is an electron microscope and what, what are the experiments that we typically do? The, um, Sam went over that a lot, but one thing that we have on the machine is we have more than just detectors. We have a whole bunch of lenses. We have like 50 lenses on this machine. So how do we control all those things? We have a custom stage, which allows us to do unique things. We have this custom detector. And all of this together has to work properly in order for us to get our experiments. So in some cases, we're juggling like 10 different systems trying to get everything to work at its peak performance. And so taking one thing out of the loop where it just works um, helps a lot. Um, so what I'm going to be um, just looking at in the next basically three minutes is looking at how we connected our custom stage to this detector and how the streaming really helps us there. So one thing that Debbie said a little bit earlier is that um, if you have this kind of unreliability in the ability to use HPC, that's a killer for experiments, absolute killer. If you can't press a button and things just work, then you've lost your region of interest or you ju it just isn't going to work in the EM, OK? So th these, these, the tightening of this um, histogram in the time to completion of a job, when we can actually get raw data turned into information is absolutely critical for us. So this is kind of a, not really a throwaway slide, but it maybe doesn't look that impressive. It's like, okay, you got like a factor of four, a factor of whatever, but to an experimentalist, this is a, a, a lifesaver. And how do, how, where does this come in? So how does this really affect us? Is that this is our old way of doing it, the local buffer system, where someone would ac press acquire, and these are all to scale. This is how long it takes to acquire a data set. The thing that the user actually sees and they're like, okay, I have data, what do I do with it now? It took this long to offload the data onto our uh, buff local buffer system. And then we had to do local counting where the whole system is being engaged during all of this time. They can't, they can't acquire a new data set until this whole process is done basically. So our local counting is just kind of basically one node and it can do it in about eight to 10 minutes. So once we added NERSC, then we could go from local buffer to NERSC scratch. And almost all of this, we had to offload, which was writing to disk locally. Then we had to pull the data to NERSC scratch. And almost all of that was basically the um, file transfer IO. So the counting job, the counting part of it, the actual processing job was absolutely tiny and kind of on the same scale as the acquire, where we want to start getting, you know, our acquisition time and our processing time to be about the same size. That, that really is what matters to us. But this already allowed us to do significantly more with the machine and the data was kind of already on NERSC and we could do Jupyter processing and things like that. So there were a lot more um, things to be done uh, than, than usual. But now with the new streaming, you acquire stream, acquire stream, acquire stream. And it's really, um, really, really, uh, it, it's pretty stable when it works. 
and uh, um, we can get way more science out of this and do things that nobody else can do with these kinds of detectors. So one thing I'm going to talk about then is automated data acquisition flows. We're really looking forward to Nurse 10 and how we can kind of use this kind of stuff. But one of the things that we do, a lot of things we do is we want to take lots of images of lots of particles, or you'd want to take lots of images of very single particles that are all over the place. I'm mostly going to be talking about the left, but the right is where the new IRI and Nurse 10, I think, will really help us a lot. So here's an actual data set that we acquired using the system where we took, um, it's only 20 by 20 images, but that was 3.6 gigabytes um, and 11,000 nanoparticles in about eight and a half hours with no human in the loop. We just set it and we got all this data out of it. But the thing here is that this is the type of data that we took. It's an ADF stem image where our detector is outputting one and a half megabit per second. Okay, and we were able to then do nine, the other one was like 20 by 20, but this is a nine by nine. And the reason why this is, is because we also took our 40 stem data at the same time. So these were simultaneously acquired and our new detector runs at 480 gigabit per second. So if you can imagine that we can run it for eight and a half hours and we get about three gigabytes of data, imagine what we can do at this totally different data rate. It's just gonna blow everything out of the water. Okay. So here's a long running experiment that we did where we didn't actually do any movement, but we just let the machine sit in one place and we took data as fast as we could with the new streaming experiment. And so this is an hour of tychography data that was acquired um, without, again, the human in the loop. We just, we just kept taking data as fast as we could. And then we looked at it using this Pi 40 stem um, that's been um, built by Colin Ofis's group. And we're able to look at not only the structure of these objects, but we can look at defocus, aberration drift, um, lateral drift of the object, and get actual structural atomic resolution information. And so we want this kind of stuff on the left to come out during the counting job. We just want to get this data in the end and very fast. So the other thing is beam sample interactions are kind of what limit almost a, a, a lot of different um, imaging technologies, either at the ALS or here. Um, and so you get all these different, like, levels of things that happen and so we we nevertheless little is known about the onset and progression especially in real space of these objects so usually what people do is they go in diffraction space they illuminate their object and they kind of look at the diffraction pattern which are these dots in diffraction space and they figure out when does the diffraction pattern go away so that means you're reducing your long range order of your crystal and you can no longer measure it. it's basically now amorphized so most of these crystals are in very critical very low um, fluence ranges. And so what we want to do is use 40 stem to visualize electron beam induced radiolytic damage resulting from asymmetric delivery of incident electrons. So what we did was we took a crystal that diffracts very nicely and at each one of these positions, so in each one of these pixels that you would see on the left, we have a diffraction pattern on the right, but we can create a really nice diffraction by kind of summing over the whole thing. The thing is we, we put the beam at one position in the crystal and then we would <clears throat> leave the beam there for a few seconds and then scan, leave the bear and then scan. And over time you can see that even though the beam is confined to a very small region here, this part, this damage expands out and out and out. So we're getting radicals that are, are um, quenched at some point, but you produce more and more radicals each time. So here we're kind of measuring how radio radiolysis and how fast it happens in the material and how it can affect uh, parts of the material that are far away. And we get this dual space information of not only real space, but also diffraction space. So this was 340 stem scans, 53 terabytes of raw data analyzed in three hours, which is uh, really, really cool really a huge amount of data. So where we're going with this is closed loop uh, automation. So we want to be able to use NERSC to be able to take this data acquisition and run that back into how to move our stage, how to uh, uh, fix our lenses, and uh, do this kind of live AI ML analysis on these very big data sets. I'm way over time, so thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions for Peter or Sam? Yeah. yeah. So So is it just that you're going from RAM to RAM and avoiding writing any disks to file? Yep. So they have 53 terabytes of RAM here? No, no, no. Each one of these data sets is 700 gigabytes. So that's actually a really important question. So what we used to have is we have eight terabytes of local storage at, at NSEM. That limited how many data sets we could acquire, period. And that's at 700 gigabytes of data set, we can take eight data sets. And then we have to count. And the counting was 10 minutes a data set. 
So you could acquire in 15 seconds and offload in two and a half minutes, blah, blah, blah. So you can kind of add all that up and that's where those- Nothing's that, changed about the switch. You have 100 gigabit between there and Correct. There. Nothing's changed about that. This was- hard, Where it's just using zero MQ. Correct. Zero MQ allows you to go from- RAM to RAM. Dev, proc, whatever to slash. Yep. Crazy. So we put everything in our RAM and then we transfer everything to your RAM and then it, all, the, all the processing is done in line. <laughs> Sorry, what? Not my RAM. <laughs> He's over at I'm talking to yeah, I'm talking yeah. to I'm talking to nurse. nurse people. Sorry. So yeah, the, the the key here thing is we also had to engage all of NERSC. Everything. We needed file transfer. We needed Jupiter. We needed uh, um, disk. We needed Scratch. We needed CFS. We needed everything. We took almost all of that out. Right. Just transferring right in. It's this is this is the way to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, great. We got in that timing diagram. The the streaming there was no longer a compute for the counting. So are you computing while you're still streaming, or yeah, is there still a compute portion? Go, Sam. Yeah. So uh, what's happening is there those four different detector sectors are as they're streaming in being stored in a cache, and once a, a frame is complete at NERSC on one of the nodes. Then it's just started. It, the, the processing starts, and so you, you don't need that many like uh, receiving threads compared to the the number of processing threads that are kind of available to us on uh, you know the, our nurse compute nodes. So yeah, the, the they they overlap. Um, for more like complicated processing stuff, you know, again, this is like a thresholding algorithm, so it's it's not terribly you know, complicated. We will definitely have to think about how the um, that overlap will happen or not. You know, uh, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Yeah. What, what's cool here though too is you could just we could just add for do we if we need more processing we get ten nodes or do we need twenty or do we need five five hundred right? Do we need five? That that's really. Otherwise we would just buy the nodes and we would just know what the size is right. I mean I don't want to I don't want to. <laughs> Take that over, right? I, I'm not an IT person. I, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. I'm an HPC person, is what I mean. Um, so you guys have all that knowledge. Yeah. So that's why we work together. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, I have a question as well. So sure. you use NERSC. What happens when NERSC is down? Have you thought about using other resources, other IRI, you know, Oscar resources? So that's like that. Does also that super sense? exciting to us yeah. because when NERSC is down, I hear no end of moaning from the users, <laughs> right? They're like, yeah. oh, no. Distiller is not working, or this not working, or I can't see the web page, or I can't do that, right? Everything is broken, right? And we go back to our 20 minutes per data, or 10 minutes per data set, right? And we are limited by what we have locally. So right now we're directly connected to NERSC, which means the data, like I have to log into NERSC and then log into our machines. Right. We have a new path that is going to be through the front door of NERSC because your ingest is now 400, uh, over 400 gigabits thanks to um, SNET, yes. Yes. SNET, whatever version it is. Um, and that would allow us also then to send data to any other HPC okay, over those fat pipes. But we need to be able to deploy what we have here also on those other HPCs. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I know too there's maybe some networking issues that come with going to other HPC Correct. sites, so yeah. But we're, we're thinking about that and we've been contacted by SNET to say, hey, could we try to do right. it somewhere else? Cool, yeah. sounds good. Right, let's thank our speakers.